Welcome, everyone. Uh, welcome to Abolition Democracy 1313. Welcome to the Abolition of Family Policing. The image you just saw had in the background a photograph taken today earlier uh, in Harlem uh, by our brilliant uh, graduate student, Anita Yandel, uh, who is participating in this uh, seminar. It's a, it's a brutal reminder. And let me just uh, show you the, the original image. Uh, they're the full photograph. It's a brutal reminder, really, uh, a brutal reminder, if you see it here, of the brutality and the violence of the family regulation ordeal. Uh, and I don't want to say system, uh, because that gives it too much coherence when, in fact, we're dealing with an ordeal, a, a medieval inquisitorial ordeal that surrounds us as we speak. The poster reminds us that we do not live in a state of exception with exceptional family separation at the border during the Trump years, but that this problem surrounds us every day. They separate children at the border of Harlem too. Um, and it brings back to my mind, uh, the introduction, the first chapter of Malcolm X's autobiography where Malcolm X describes in such a powerful way, uh, the destruction of his own family. Uh, how he was taken from his mother and all his siblings as well, how he would eventually be sent into home detention and then a reformatory school, how his mom would be civilly committed for 26 years in an asylum. Uh, I tried to describe that at the start of the introductory blog post uh, for this session. And of course it culminated in this, in this paragraph where uh, Malcolm X writes, you know, I truly believe uh, that if ever a state social agency destroyed a family, it destroyed ours. We wanted and tried to stay together. Our home didn't have to be destroyed, but the welfare, the courts, and their doctor gave us the one, two, three punch. Okay. And he adds, it, ours was not the only case of this kind. <clears throat> now, um, <clears throat> of this he writes, right, that it didn't have to be. Uh, but it existed, he says, because of a society's failure, hypocrisy, greed, and lack of mercy and compassion. Just mercy, right? just mercy. We will, I know, address the relationship between the family regulation ordeal and our punitive society, our carceral society. And to guide us, to help us think through this area, it's my great honor tonight to welcome two brilliant people to our Abolition Democracy 1313 seminar and to help us think through family policing. Let me introduce and welcome our guests. Over the past few months, uh, I've gotten to know the brilliant work of Timber Hudson, uh, thanks to Dorothy Roberts, and it's wonderful to have them both with us this evening. Um, um, please join us uh, as I introduce you. Uh, uh, Timber Hudson, uh, is a storyteller, teller, uh, multidisciplinary artist, and activist. Hi, Timber. Uh, deeply committed to centering, uplifting, and empowering Black LGBTQ plus communities to abolish systems that perpetuate trauma and oppression, including especially in the domain of family regulation. Uh, Timber Hudson currently works at the Hugh Lane Wellness Foundation, uh, where they lead the creation and implementation of strategic planning to increase the support available for LB LGBTQIA2S communities across Western Pennsylvania, including young people and families within the child regulation system. Uh, prior to his role, uh, prior to their uh, role, to that role, uh, Timber served as the LGBTQ plus policy associate at the Biden Foundation. Uh, they also provided technical assistance and research support to other national youth serving organizations working to implement LGBTQ plus inclusion and equity into their programs, policies, and practices. Timber has a multimedia blog titled They Slay which centers on their life as a black non-binary person. And we'll put that in the chat box so that you can all uh, go uh, look at that website. Uh, and it discusses their thoughts and feelings around social justice, foster care, uh, mental health, and powerful experiences that continue to connect them with communities around the world. 
the team at the CCCCT, including Judia Udell and Fonda Shen, have been working over the past few weeks to support a new project of Timber Hudson's, the Garden of Vitality, uh, which Timber will present this evening. So this is very exciting, and I'm really glad to welcome you, Timber. Thanks for joining us. Um, it's a great honor as well and a pleasure to introduce Professor Dorothy Roberts, uh, whose work I have admired for decades. Hi, Dorothy. Uh, uh, decades, decades, maybe since 1994 when we first met at uh, 29 Garden Street, huh? Um, Professor Dorothy Roberts is the 14th Penn Integrates Knowledge Professor at the University of Pennsylvania with joint appointments in the departments of Africana Studies and Sociology and the Law School, where she also holds the inaugural Raymond Pace and Sadie Tanner Mosell Alexander Chair. Uh, she is the founding director of the Penn Program on Race, Science and Society in the Center for Africana Studies and her pathbreaking work in law, public policy and abolition focuses on the most urgent contemporary issues at the intersection of health, uh, social justice, crime and punishment, and bioethics, uh, especially as they impact the lives of women, uh, Black women, uh, African Americans, children. Of the many scholars who study uh, the child regulation protocols in this country, I would say that none surpassed Dorothy Roberts in the breadth, scope, and the brilliance uh, of her work. Uh, Dorothy is now completing a new book calling for the abolition of family policing, and um, we're going to be focusing today on that work. Uh, in fact, it's, it's because of that new manuscript that we kind of pivoted this session, which was originally going to be on kind of marital policing or coverture, uh, marital regulation, and uh, to the question of family policing. So we're, we're really delighted uh, to have you with us at this moment when you're thinking through uh, the manuscript. Uh, Dorothy Roberts laid the foundation for critique in several earlier books. Of course, first, you know, all of you, uh, Killing uh, the Black Body, Pantheon, uh, 1997, which, of course, begins with a history of the brutal objectification of Black women and children during the antebellum period. Um, uh, Professor uh, Roberts there documented how uh, black women uh, were abused and raped to procreate uh, children who would then become the slave property of their masters and uh, how children in the family were instrumentalized as a tool to dominate and control black women and men. And, and also how public relief and welfare agencies were used traditionally as a way to surveil, monitor, discipline and supervise families. Uh, in a later book, uh, Shattered Bonds, uh, the Color of Child Welfare, which came out in 2002. Uh, Dorothy then took on more specifically the domain of what was and is called uh, welfare, child welfare, um, which we are uh, in the process of renaming, right, as we speak. Uh, Dorothy showed there how economic and political forces uh, lead to family separation, to the types of harmful stereotyping that reinforce those dire consequences uh, for African-American mothers. Uh, as she wrote there, uh, racial inequalities in the child welfare system cause serious group-based harms, reinforce disparaging stereotypes about fa black family unfitness uh, and need for white supervision by destroying a sense of family autonomy and self-determination among many black uh, Americans. And by weakening Blacks' collective ability to overcome institutionalized discrimination. Uh, and by examining the evidence of, of racism in the child welfare system, uh, she highlights, she writes, I highlight the political role of the child welfare system in America, a role often obscured by a focus on its rescue of individual children from neglectful parents, which I think is something uh, we will be talking about. Now, uh, these earlier writings really lay the groundwork for uh, what Dorothy Roberts is working on today and we'll be discussing, uh, and uh, a sketch of which I think we have in the article Abolishing Policing Also Means Abolishing Family Regulation uh, from this past summer, which we've got on the website. So people should be reading all of those uh, posts as well. Um, and finally, in, in, in the argument to abolish family policing, uh, uh, Professor Roberts is putting in conversation the work on family regulation with the broader vision of what she calls abolition constitutionalism, 
uh, which he outlined in a recent article by that title uh, in the Harvard Law Review and which we read actually for the first session of this seminar. So where in, in there, Dorothy really draws the blueprint of how to reorient constitutional law discourse towards an abolitionist agenda. And that I think will be in part where we're headed with today's discussion. I should note for everyone also, uh, before we get started, that Dorothy Roberts will be co-chairing a symposium with Professor Jane Spinak of uh, Columbia Law School next month, titled Strengthened Bonds, uh, Abolishing the Child Welfare System and Reinvisiting Child Well-Being. It's hosted by the Columbia Journal of Race and Law. Uh, Fonda just put the link in the chat box so you can all, um, find out about it, it will be uh, at Columbia Law School. It's gonna begin on the evening of March 25th, and then it's gonna continue through March 24th. And I really do encourage everyone uh, to participate. Um, it's, uh, it's an extraordinary, uh, pan there are extraordinary panels and, 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 and much of it focuses on the uh, brilliant and prescient work that uh, Dorothy Roberts has been doing for decades now. Uh, so, by the way, welcome, Dorothy. <laughs> Thank you, Bernard. And it, it has been almost 30 years yeah. since we met each other at, I, uh, on Garden Street. I know. I date it by uh, is, Isadora's birth. So ah. uh, I know exactly how long we've known each other. <laughs> yes. And if I could just add a little other personal note, yes. my daughter, Yauska, who accompanied me, babysat right I, yeah. I believe yes yeah and, uh, and she just had a baby on February 12th so yeah. the, the Josephine. cycle continues <laughs> Josephine. yes I know it's yeah. wonderful so yeah the timing is the timing does kind of it kind of fits well nicely huh um very exciting congratulations to you Thank and to Yauska uh that's so exciting and wonderful and wonderful that you could be with her uh last week yeah um, so, uh, the plan for today is to really start with, um, is to start with, uh, I'm not sharing my screen anymore, right? Okay, good. Uh, it's to start with uh, uh, Timber Hudson's spoken word uh, art project and, and also the Garden of Vitality project. So, why don't I uh, be quiet at this point and turn it over to you, Timber. Uh, to uh, present your your work. Thank you, and thank you so much for having me. It's an honor to be included. Um, Trayvon Martin. On February 26, 2012, a 17-year-old unarmed Black child was murdered by a neighborhood watchman in Florida. At the time, I was 17, and a senior in high school in rural Oklahoma, a world apart. I never really knew his name until my first semester of university. Somehow Trayvon's name and his death were never discussed amongst my group of friends. Can you guess the racial makeup of my friends? Looking back at it, it makes sense I had never heard of Trayvon. I spent so much time trying to fit in with my white friends, meaning I tried to minimize any perceived difference. I spent money I didn't have on Abercrombie and Fitch and American Eagle and the buckle, you know, classic Americana clothes. I made sure I spoke as articulate as possible. You see, it was important for me to belong and to be seen as one of them. My first encounter with Trayvon's story was on Facebook. Someone, I'm not sure who, shared his story and my first thought was, what did he do? I, like so many others, have been taught to believe in the deviancy of black boys and men. Assuming that Trayvon, a 17 year old unarmed child, had some blame in his own death. At some point, the media's and my friend's rhetoric about Trayvon's culpability in his own death made me want to dig a bit deeper, do my own research. Trayvon was an awakening of sorts. His story taught me that folks read me as a threat based on my race and perceived gender identity. That despite my articulate nature, 
Abercrombie and Fitch, fake glass frames, and even colored contacts, I too was still seen as deviant. My fears about how the world saw me manifested in the summer of 2016. I was driving home in my white 2004 Chevy Malibu that I named Privilege. I really love that car. I paid for it myself and there is no other place I would rather lip sync to Beyonce. <laughs> Suddenly I hear sirens and I'm blinded by the red and blue lights in my rear view mirror. I was scared. I remember quickly putting my license and registration in the cup holder and my hands on the wheel. From my left side view mirror, I could see the officer exiting her vehicle. The officer was a white woman. She had one hand on her unclipped weapon and the other she used her flashlight to search the back and surrounding areas of my vehicle as she approached. My heart was beating so loud that I could hear it pulsing in my ears. I struggled to breathe and could feel myself spiraling into a panic attack before even speaking with the officer. At that moment, I couldn't help but think, am I next? I tried to perform my most articulate and competent self. It was important for her to understand that I was a good one. I was not a threat. While the officer was interrogating me, she noticed my hands trembling, struggling to keep grasp of the steering wheel. And she asked, what's wrong? You scared? Followed by a mischievous grin. In the end, the officer gave me a warning for going 40 in the 35. And I returned back to my dorm, shaken, feeling vulnerable and crippled with anxiety. I was in college from 2012 to 2018. During this time, we discussed police brutality after watching unarmed person after unarmed person become victims of state sanctioned violence followed by acquittal after acquittal after acquittal after acquittal. Yet so many people refuse to see black people as the victims. Sandra Bland, Tamir Rice, Eric Gardner, Philando Castile, Ayanna Stanley Jones, Rakia Boyd, For the first time in my life, I had to sit and think about what it means to occupy this world as a black person. I had no one to teach me about the reality of being young, black, assigned male at birth in this society. No one had the talk with me. I spent my childhood seeking protections from the threats that I lived with every day. The other residents saw me as too fat, too femme, not black enough, weak, disposable. And so I often became the target of their rage. Perhaps if my queer identity didn't deem me unplaceable or hard to place, I might have learned lessons about my blackness earlier than my freshman year of college. Sometimes I feel ashamed about all the things that I never learned about my race, my gender identity, my assigned sex at birth and my sexuality while placed in congregate care. But I do remember the things that I did learn. At my last placement, at one of my last placements, I found refuge in the kitchen. I learned that if I was around staff, I was protected from my, from my tormentors. Ms. V was the cook at my last placement. She welcomed me into her kitchen with open arms. Now, Ms. V wasn't gonna let anybody be in her kitchen without putting in some work. <laughs> the number one rule is you don't ever, start clean, don't ever start cooking in the dirty kitchen, you gotta clean up. In the kitchen, I learned how to make different types of pasta, deviled eggs, fried fish, and more. If Ms. V was cooking, I was learning how to make it. Our trips to Sam Club would have to be the most memorable. We would both sing and dance to The Temptations and other Motown classics while riding her Cadillac DeVille. <laughs> I always think of the time that I spent with Miss V, especially when I make pancakes. 
She taught me that if you cook the pancake in a little oil, the edges will come out nice and crispy and it's worked every time. I loved cooking and I loved the attention Miss V gave me when she taught me. I loved excelling at something that most people considered girls work. Being in the kitchen with Miss V made me feel loved, seen and safe. James Baldwin wrote, it took years of vomiting up all the filth I had been taught about myself and half believed before I was able to walk on this earth as though I have the right to be here. Today, I feel confident and beautiful in my body. I have unsubscribed from society's perception of me or who I am expected to be and committed to practicing loving and accepting the totality of my greatness. I accept that it is not my responsibility to appease anyone's discomfort with who I am. No longer will I allow anyone, including myself, to pick and choose what makes me worth loving. Our existence as Black, queer, and trans communities is not something to be ashamed of. We deserve to see ourselves living full and abundant lives, falling in love, working within the community, and more. We deserve to be celebrated. Indeed. <laughs> Indeed, Timber. Thank you so much for sharing that with us. Um, you so deserve to be celebrated. And uh, that's what we're here in part to do this evening, to celebrate your brilliance and your talent. Um, it was Dorothy who put us in touch, really. Um, Dorothy, you had, you had um, worked with uh, Timber, is it? Well, I, I saw Timber as a panelist on a webinar. I can't remember which one it was, Timber, but um, uh, so. Uh, it was the road to abolition with CSSP or in the up-in movement. Okay, all right, that was it. <laughs> Fortunately, there have been quite a few webinars on uh, abolishing family regulation lately, so much more this year than ever before, which is so encouraging. But Timber uh, held, I think you actually held up a copy of Shattered Bonds. I, 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 I knew that I was watching necessarily in the audience, <laughs> and so I had to get in touch with them and see what was uh, what this was all about. And then we communicated with each other on Twitter, I guess. Yeah. And uh, <laughs> I don't, it, it was just a, a kindred spirit. Right, and right. So right. when Bernard asked, uh, is there anyone you'd like to join? And you were the first person I thought of. Yeah. Uh, to, to be on the program. I, I didn't have any idea what you were going to do. <laughs> fabulous, whatever it was. And I also think it's important to include people who have been involved in the system. Um, and so that's part of why I wanted, wanted you to be part of this. And I'm so happy that you were able to do it. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you. And that was so moving. And, uh, those words and those words of James Baldwin that you read, uh, years of vomiting up all the filth uh, is so poignant and so well said. Um, and so now um, you uh, deserve to be celebrated. And one of the things, the projects that you're working on now is in a way celebrating others. Um, and so why don't you tell us a little bit about that project because- uh, Absolutely. Um, so the Garden of Vitality is an online gallery to celebrate the brilliance, the beauty and the lives of black and LGBTQ plus people who have been impacted by the system. Um, when I originally was contacted for to be a part of this, um, generally when people reach out, they're like, well, can you speak or can you be a panelist? Um, it's one of the first times that someone has asked me for my artwork or my experience as a storyteller um, specifically. And so I was like, okay, I gotta whip something together. <laughs> like they, want, they want me. <laughs> so um, I put this together because this piece that I, that I did at the beginning was a part of um, a convening with CSSP. It was in collaboration with four other people um, and all four of them were people who've been impacted by the system. And we each had our own um, spoken word, if you will. Some of them um, overlapped with one another while some of them definitely stood alone. 
And I think the most magical thing about that, um, about sharing that, about being in that space was that my story wasn't the only one that shared. I think so often when we ask people um, who have been impacted by the system to be a part of things, um, once we find those one or two that are really good, that can energize an audience and that can really hit home in the places that we need to, that's kind of where we stick until they're too old, if you will. And so my idea behind creating this garden of vitality is one, to provide an online platform for Black and LGBTQ plus people who've been impacted by the system to be celebrated. Um, the prompts that I use specifically for each of the people um, are not prompts that are probing into their, their personal experience with the system. They're rather prompts that um, can be used as inspiration. What makes them powerful? Um, what message do they offer, would they offer to Black and LGBTQ plus people um, who have been uh, formerly, currently, or in the future will be impacted by the family regulation system? And so my idea behind this, again, was really just to provide an online space to where people can come and see inspiration, where potentially Black and LGBTQ plus young people can come and see themselves represented, um, living full and, one, and abundant lives. People within this gallery, some are activists, um, some are nonprofit owners, others are directors of their department, and like the levels of expertise that is included within this gallery and the depth of personality of stories of community is truly um, remarkable. And I encourage everyone to really check it out. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. It is beautiful uh, and very moving. Now, um, actually, let's let's I'll share it again just so that people get a sense of where there are different uh, aspects that they can click on and how they can navigate it. In part, um, you were talking about so so of course the homepage describes the project really well, and then the garden itself is under the our garden page, right? And so right. these so. Uh, and, and people and every, everyone can go uh, click on uh, any one of these to see them and their responses like this. Mm -hmm. um, and how did you how did you choose your guests and how many guests do you have and how many guests <laughs> do you want to have? <laughs> so I reached out to basically everybody that I knew that was black and LGBTQ plus and had experience with the system, um, but also some people that I didn't know, but we were in similar circles. Um, I chose most of the people that are in the gallery are people that I've met through my journey in advocacy. Uh, we've we've um, learned to um, share our stories together. We have attended congressional briefings. Um, we have advocated together at the White House. Um, we have lived together. We've been roommates in D.C. We have been community. We've been that um, Mm -hmm. that holiday um, mm -hmm. gathering that that we needed um, that we didn't have maybe mm -hmm. um, and the people within this gallery have really just been a community there's still people that I worked with on a mm -hmm. number of projects today um, mm -hmm. and now I mean you and I and Dorothy and, and most of the people know what the, you mean by the system uh, but not everybody maybe on the on on, on the webinar does so the different aspects of the system include foster uh, the foster uh, system, parenting system. Why don't you tell us a little bit about all of the different parts of the system that in some sense are represented here on this um, by these uh, folks, really? Yeah, absolutely. So I definitely say that the family, family regulation uh, system is definitely the one that goes across um, the across everyone's experience, if you will. Um, there are some people within this gallery who um, have been adopted. Um, others um, do have experience with juvenile justice. Um, some um, have experience with mental health um, and so on. So mm -hmm. I think that when, we, when we're talking about the, the different systems um, within currently who's in the gallery, I think we cover a lot of the systems, if you okay, will. Okay, good. And the plan is to have 100 by the end of the year, is that right? Yes, I would like to have 100 by the end of 2021. Excellent, excellent. And then also on the website, you have the Q&A that you uh, did with, um, with Julie Udell and, and, and Fonda Shen. And so yes. uh, people should read that as well because it's, um, it's very moving, it's very powerful. And um, yeah, it's... Um, it's a celebration. So 
thank you uh, for creating this artwork project for for our seminar, really. And what is so exciting is that, you know, in in, in a sense, you know, we we started talking about it just a few weeks ago, right? And uh, and what's nice is that it will actually live on for forever and and continue to grow and we'll be we'll be reading and watching uh, as it does so thank you for that yeah it's it's such a beautiful and inspiring way of resisting the harms of the system and, and uh, including people who are affected by it and how they how they can fight back and even your website is a form of fighting back and it's really beautiful. Thank yeah. you so much. Yeah, 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 yeah. Yeah, a real, a real, it, I would, I was gonna say fighting back resistance, but it's more than that, right? Um, maybe this is the, this is part of the abolition discussion we're gonna have, mm -hmm. right? Uh, it's more than resistance and fighting back. It's also building something mm -hmm. beautiful. Right. Um, yeah. Yeah. So wonderful. And so I invite everyone to take their time. I put the website address for the Garden of Vitality in our chat box. Um, and, uh, and everybody should take an opportunity to, to look at that. Um, thank you, Timber. Uh, so, um, so Dorothy, uh, I was hoping that you could tell us a little bit about your book manuscript, uh, which we will all be excited to read. Uh, although it, it takes woefully long to get from even a complete book manuscript to a published book in this country. <coughs> but why don't you tell us a little bit about that project and how it ties to the broader issues that you're also working on in terms of abolition, democracy, et cetera. Yeah, well, thank you. I wanna thank you again, Bernard, for inviting me to uh, be part of this wonderful seminar and uh, for inviting Timber as well. And I'm so happy both of us could participate. Uh, so um, I think I'll, I'll start uh, by talking about how I became a family policing abolitionist, maybe starting a little bit with my book, Shattered Bonds. Uh, which came out of my book, Killing the Black Body. Um, Shattered Bonds was, as you mentioned, published in 2001, 20 years ago now. And it was documenting the racial realities of family policing in America. At the time, more than half a million children were in foster care and black families were the most likely of any group to be torn apart by the system. Uh, they made up nearly half of the US foster care population, even though they were less than a fifth of the nation's children. And that meant they were four times as likely to be in foster care as white children were. So uh, when I first became aware of this racial and racist aspect of the system, it was when I was working on killing the black body. Uh, I, I, I guess I knew that uh, so-called child welfare system existed, but I'd never encountered it. And um, I hadn't really thought very much about it as a political system, you know, as a system of uh, oppression and terror. And as I was working on killing the black body, investigating the prosecutions of black women for drug use during pregnancy, I discovered that thousands and thousands of black mothers were having their newborns taken from them at birth and kept at the hospital because of a positive drug test. And so I realized that child removal was even more widespread and in some ways more devastating than the prosecutions that I was, you know, extremely alarmed about as well. And 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 uh, analyzed as, and, and opposed as being racist um, and devaluing, extremely brutally devaluing of black mothers. Uh, so once I started looking into it, the 
racism was so obvious. I really couldn't even understand why this wasn't a national, you know, a crisis because uh, I was in Chicago at the time teaching at Northwestern. And when I started going into uh, child welfare proceedings in Chicago, you notice right away, as soon as you go into the court there, that uh, in Chicago, really all the families involved were black families. So, uh, you know, I wrote in Shattered Bonds that if you didn't know what the purpose of these courts was, you would have to conclude that it was they were designed to monitor, regulate, and punish poor black families. Because that's that's all that's what they were doing. Uh, and so uh, now 20 years later, black communities are still targeted for child welfare intervention. Uh, more than half of black children, this is a, a study that came out since Shattered Bonds, but um, it found that more than half of Black children in America will be subjected to a Child Protective Services investigation at some point during their childhoods. I mean, that's huge, right? Half of Black children. Uh, and by the way, in case there's some people that don't know what that means, that means that state agents come into the house and most people whose homes they come to don't aren't aware that they can resist you know the, this intrusion without a warrant into their home uh, and even if they thought they could they're afraid not to let them in because they're threatened that your children are will take your children away and they can do that they can come with police officers and take your children away from you so um, and these investigations are extremely intrusive. They can involve strip searching children, interrogating children apart from their parents, interrogating the parents, you know, threatening. The whole system is based on threatening to take children away. You know, you, you asked Timber about what is the system and it involves investigating, you know, there's the child protective services part of it, as they call it, which is investigating allegations of abuse and neglect, which may be completely anonymous allegations that come in through a child abuse hotline. Uh, and they also can come in through mandate, mandated reporters or just anyone who wants to report suspected child abuse and neglect. And so a part of it is the investigation of families who've been reported. And then the caseworkers, uh, again, who are often accompanied by police officers because they're coming there anticipating that they may take children out of the home every time they come into a home. And it, this is also something that people don't think about a lot, but you know, as, as that poster you showed, uh, Family separation happens in Harlem, it happens in, in communities all over the country. And while there was a lot of attention on the trauma of taking children away from parents, the trauma both to parents and children and other family members, uh, when, tr when the Trump administration uh, employed this policy, people really think about the trauma that goes on in black communities and indigenous communities all the time, every single day at you know many times the rate even of what was going on at the border. Uh, and uh, that can happen with an investigation in addition to the trauma of the investigation itself. So, uh, and then there's possible placement in the child welfare system. I, I'm sorry, in foster care in particular, substitute care. There's also been a, a study done recently that was published in Stanford Law Review, and I'm sorry, I don't remember the author's name of it. I wasn't planning to talk about this, but in answer to your question, uh, he found that there are just as many children, uh, about 500,000 children, in addition to the 500 who are placed in foster care through a judicial proceeding, there's 500,000 probably more who are in a shadow foster care system where because of this threat of 
family separation, the caseworkers just tell families, you have to split up or, or, or impose some other kind of intrusive regulation on the family. But for example, there's an allegation of child abuse and neglect, and they may say to a family member, you have to leave the home or we're we'll take your children. Or you better, you have to put your children in the care of a relative or a friend or a neighbor, or we'll go to court against you. So this is a, you know, a massive system of regulation. And then there's all the regulation that goes on once the children are placed in foster care, because the way this works is if your child is placed in foster care, you have to abide by all these requirements and meet them in order to get your child back. And that is another big part. Uh, so there's surveillance, there's investigation, there's taking children away, there's maintaining children in foster care. And then there's some of what Timber mentioned as well is what happens to children. You know, some of them go back home, that's supposed to be the intent of it. But for black children, they are more at risk of never going back home and, uh, and, and also less likely to be adopted, which means that they stay in foster care for long periods of time and what's called age out of foster care. Um, and when they age out of foster care, sometimes they're simply left without any resources. Uh, and part of that is because the state takes whatever assets they have in supposedly in compensation for caring for them in foster care, uh, even though they're obligated by federal law to so-called care for them. Uh, and yet many, many child welfare agencies take assets like social security benefits um, from, from children. So uh, that's a, a little taste of what this huge multi-billion dollar apparatus does to terrorize uh, families, especially in poor communities, uh, black communities, brown communities, indigenous communities. Okay, so now let me get to what I plan to say. I just wanted to explain uh, it, because a lot of people don't know, they don't realize they, they've been fooled into thinking that this is a provision of services to families in need, and it is a form of caring for children. Uh, and uh, there hasn't been a lot of political analysis of the role that, uh, that, that these forces play. Um, okay, so let me, what I, what I wanted to talk about, let me say this, uh, uh, make these points is that uh, I think there's a lot that the prison abolition movement and which is much more longstanding and, and uh, developed and well-known, familiar than the really just emerging family policing or family regulation abolition movement. And I think there's a lot we can learn from each other. And, and that's what I wanted to point out in part to tie what our subject today to the broader issues of abolition that you've been talking about in the, in the series um, this semester. Uh, so um, part of the reason that I became a family policing abolitionist is because of what I've learned over the last 20 years about prison abolition and being drawn to the theory and practice and framework and inspiration of prison abolitionists. Uh, it became clear to me that the movement to abolish police prisons and surveillance was deeply connected to the need to abolish family policing. Uh, so, in that article you mentioned abolition constitutionalism, I, I point out three aspects of uh, abolitionist philosophy that I think are very helpful. Um, one that we can trace 
today's carceral punishment system back to slavery and the racial capitalist regime that relied on and sustained slavery. Uh, and then the, that the expanding carceral system functions today to oppress black and other politically marginalized people in order to maintain uh, you know, a, an evolving racial capitalist regime. And then finally, that we can imagine and build a more humane and democratic society that no longer relies on caging people to meet human needs and solve social problems. Uh, those principles lead to the conclusion that the only way to transform our society from a slavery-based society to, to a free society is to abolish the prison industrial complex and create a world where, as Angela Davis said, as the title of her book, uh, one of her books, prisons are obsolete. So just in the same way that we can trace the US criminal punishment system, policing, prisons, capital punishment, surveillance to racialized chattel slavery, and uh, which, I, which I think is a helpful way of thinking about it. I, I don't think it's the only way of thinking about carceral systems in the United States, but it, I think it is, is persuasive, one, a, a persuasive way of pointing out that, for example, the first police forces in the United States were slave patrols, and that Jim Crow police and private citizens who abetted them used terror to enforce racial subjugation, not to apprehend people culpable for crimes, that there is a disconnect between culpability and incarceration. It's that the purpose isn't to punish people who are culpable. The purpose of police and prisons and surveillance is to uh, control and subjugate uh, communities regardless of guilt or innocence. Um, and the, uh, similarly, we could apply the same analysis to family policing. It also has origins, as you pointed out with the quote from Malcolm X in uh, the forcible separation of enslaved families, the control of emancipated black children as apprentices to former white enslavers, the removal of indigenous children as an instrument of tribal genocide. Uh, the whole point of the child welfare system has always been to regulate economically and racially marginalized communities. That, that's why there, there aren't any, virtually any at all, you know, wealthy white people in the child welfare system. That's not because they don't harm their children ever. Uh, it's because that's not the point of the system. It's, it's not intended, it's not designed to protect children or care for children. It's designed to, really to do the opposite, to blame uh, marginalized communities for harms to their children that are caused by societal inequities, by structural racism, by poverty, um, by, uh, by sexism and patriarchy. Uh, so family policing helps to not only blame them, but then keep them in a subordinated status by disrupting their relationships in their communities. And more broadly, it implements an approach to what's supposed to be child welfare that actually supports an unequal and racist social structure. I just, just like prisons, are a, a, an oppressive and punitive way of addressing social problems and human needs. That's what family policing does as well. Uh, so um, another thing that prison abolitionists have taught us is that the system's repressive outcomes don't result from a malfunction. Uh, you know, it's, it's not the case that the reason why uh, unarmed, so many unarmed black people have been killed by police officers because of the bad apples in the police force. No, it's because 
the police force is designed to intimidate and violently control black and brown communities. So it's the design uh, that leads to these horrific outcomes, uh, which are not just, although you know, we should be horrified and work against cases of murder by police officers, but if they also engage in everyday intimidation and violence against uh, people living in black and brown communities. So um, this, it's a, we can learn from that the same thing about family policing that there is no malfunction in the system that creates uh, the racial disproportionality. Uh, you know, when I, uh, when I started working on shattered bonds, there, there wasn't much attention to racial disparities, to these statistics. And since then, there's now this buzzword, racial disproportionality. And uh, pro probably, you know, every uh, major child welfare system has some kind of task force to deal with racial disproportionality and recommendations for reform. Um, I've participated in some of those. I actually worked for nine years on an expert panel that was trying to reform uh, foster care in Washington state. Uh, I've spoken at numerous trainings to try to get caseworkers to be less racially biased. You know, I've, I've, I've done it all. And uh, that's part of the reason I know it won't work because uh, all of these projects by foundations and welfare departments to reduce the foster care population and its racial disparities, none of them has worked. Uh, in fact, what happens is that there may be a little bit of reduction in disparities or populations. Actually, it fluctuates depending on factors that, have, that aren't related to uh, actual amounts of children's needs or child abuse and neglect. They have to do with other political factors. Uh, but none of it has changed the way in which the family policing operates. Uh, it continues to operate in a racist way and in a way that relies on terrorizing families. Uh, and it continues to, con this, this ideology that the reason for children's harms to children uh, is the pathology of uh, of parents that still through all of these reforms has been maintained. And uh, so then the, because the foundational logic is still there, uh, the system ends up just absorbing whatever efforts to mitigate the flaws or continues to reproducing its terror in some other way. Uh, so the, the, the last thing I want to mention is something that you brought up, uh, Bernard. And well, and let me just say that in, in Timber, uh, in your remarks, I also, uh, I, I was really moved when you were talking about how deviancy and culpability are attached, you know, to black men and boys. And, and your first question when you uh, heard about Trayvon Martin was what did he do? And often that is the question that's asked about children in the foster care system is, well, what did their parents do to them? And, it, and in, I'm sure you could testify to this, in a blink of an eye, the children be, now become the seen as deviant and culpable. 
And that's partly why there is this back and forth between the juvenile justice system, the prison system, and, and the foster care system. So, um, but the last point I wanna make is that one of the lessons that we learn from prison abolition is that, and this is what I was referring to when I said you mentioned this, Bernard, is that it's not just about tearing down a system. It, it, it's essentially about building a different society that has no need for prisons and police. Uh, I'll, I'll quote, uh, and any discussion of abolition should quote Miriam Kaba. So she writes, it's the complete and utter dismantling of prisons, police and surveillance as they currently exist within our culture. And it's also the building up of new ways of relating to each other. Uh, prisons will only cease to exist when the social, economic and political conditions eliminate the need for them. And so abolitionists are working toward a society where prisons are inconceivable. And that's true for the abolition of family policing as well. And something that I think a lot of people don't understand and, and is a point of resistance to even thinking about abolishing the family policing system because their question is, well, what's gonna happen to all the abused and neglected children? Uh, well, the main harms to children in America are not caused by their parents. They're caused by the deep inequalities that exist in wealth, uh, in incarceration, in healthcare, in, in stere stereotypes about people, in the value that uh, people are accorded, that's reflected in every institution, in education. I could go on and on every single institution. And uh, abolishing this false way, you know, this terroristic way of pretending to address them is tied with addressing those harms instead of pretending that it's the fault of parents uh, that, uh, that causes the harms to children. And as prison abolitionists are doing, figuring out better ways of dealing with harms that do occur within communities. Uh, so just in the same way that prison abolitionists, as many of them are working, I mean, so for some of them, this is their entire work, is figuring out how to deal with family violence. Uh, often it's thought of as violence between adults, but this also applies to violence that occurs uh, against children in the home. We know that the system we have now doesn't work it doesn't protect children from harm, whether it's harm from structural inequalities or harm from violence of, by adults in the home. Uh, and so we are working to create better ways, more effective ways, more humane and just ways of addressing families' needs and addressing violence in the home. Uh, now, I just wanna mention as well that there's a lot that family policing abolitionists have to offer <laughs> to prison abolitionists. Uh, I think that we can, and I say we as a, as a family policing abolitionist, but I also am a prison abolitionist. And I think that, um, that family policing abolitionists and, and thinking about abolishing family policing as part of a broader abolitionist movement can help to show how carceral logics extend, extend beyond prison walls and police stations, which is something that prison abolitionists, many of them emphasize, but may not necessarily have thought about 
how family policing is included in uh, carceral logics and, and, um, and practices. So uh, one example of that is uh, I think a, a lack of awareness of how family policing is entangled with police, criminal courts and prisons, forming a coherent carceral machine. So part of the connection has to do with the way in which these systems function similarly. And I, and I, I spoke about that a bit, but they also are integrated in the way they work, you know, the way they operate uh, with home invasions and monitoring of families by the state, by state agents, um, forcible seizure of children, uh, permanent severing of family ties, all of these reflect not only a carceral logic that parallels the criminal legal system, but also uh, relies on it as backup, you know, violent backup for, for its work. Uh, also, uh, state child protective, so-called child protective services, family policing authorities increasingly use modern surveillance technologies and coordinate with law enforcement agencies to manage the same populations more efficiently. Uh, we're talking about the same families. And I could, you know, for lack of time, I, I, I won't go into all the ways, but there's so many ways in which they're connected ideologically and practically. So family policing is not just like police, it is a form of policing. You know, it is part of the carceral regime. Now, uh, the reason, one of the reasons I think this is so important is because without understanding this, some prison abolitionists might make the mistake of recommend, and have made the mistake of recommending that defunding of police entail reallocating the money to child protective services. Um, there were people who, who, you know, who stated that that's part, you know, that was a uh, proposal for one of the thing, better ways that uh, money spent on law enforcement could be spent to, uh, you know, on alternatives. But uh, as I as I've said, uh, these proposals ignore how family policing also surveils and represses black, brown and indigenous communities in ways that are very similar to law enforcement and entangled with law enforcement. And so diverting money, putting more money into child protection agencies would result in even more brutal state intrusion in black communities. Uh, in fact, just like we're advocating defund the police, we should be advocating defund uh, family policing and also work to dismantle the ways in which it enlists people to be mandated reporters, you know, to report uh, on uh, each other to CPS for investigation of families. So rather than divesting from one oppressive system to invest in another, we should be working together to abolish all carceral institutions and create a radically different way of meeting families' needs. Uh, and that's the second reason why I think it's important to see these as both the, the systems as integrated forms of oppression and ordeal, as, as you said, uh, very similar ordeals, extremely. I mean, that, that we could talk just about the ways in which the ordeal of being arrested and incarcerated is like the ordeal of someone coming into your home and taking your children away from you. It, there's, so, there's so many parallels to it. Uh, so um, if we have, 
a coherent political analysis of carceral systems and logics that integrates our understanding of criminal law enforcement and prisons with state surveillance, reassembling and destruction of families. Uh, we can, I think, have such a powerful common movement to bring down all these extensions of the carceral state and a common vision for meeting human needs, preventing violence and caring for children, families and communities. And I, uh, despite the, the way in which over the last 20 years, so much effort has led to little change, I am very inspired by the work of especially Black mothers and youth like Timber who have been involved in the system, who are leading a, a, a new movement to, um, to end family policing and build a more humane world. And I think we can work collectively with prison abolitionists to reimagine the very meaning of child welfare and uh, build a world that truly meets families' uh, families' needs. So I'll I'll end there. Thank you, Dorothy. Yeah, that was a discussion. Yeah, yeah, and I I, I know I, I had agreed to go first, and and Timber, you you, you were going to pipe in, but that was such a, an, a a kind of an important call out to the work you're doing. Um, so uh, it's really um, the synergies are really here. Great. I don't know if you just want to reflect on that for a second and then I'll go ahead, you know, um, Timber. Um, one of the things that really stood out to me about everything that you presented was the uh, collaboration between prison abolitionists and between uh, family uh, policing abolitionists. Um, as someone with my experience with, within the system, um, I can very clearly see how the two systems work in tandem to entrap. Mm -hmm. Um, children to um, impact our lives in different ways. Um, and it's, it's so clear to me. And I think that um, it's really important to look to the work of prison abolitionists and work collabor collaboratively with them. Um, one of the, um, I was on Facebook the other day and someone had shared a quote. It wasn't my first time hearing it, um, but it hit me in a different way this time. Mm -hmm. um, and it was that 80% of people who are within um, prisons have had experience in foster care. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. If that doesn't confirm that these two systems are interacting, that they are in cahoots, if you will, um, I don't know what will. <laughs> yeah, yeah. It, it, it does seem so obvious. If Can I respond, Bernard? I know you <laughs> had questions too. It does seem so obvious that that shows uh, uh, a connection between the two and the way in which foster care is structured to make children and youth vulnerable to incarceration. Uh, you know, it pushes them into prison, juvenile detention in prison in so many ways. I mean, one example is just runaway, what they call runaways. You know, even the terminology is like, escape enslaved people running away. That's the terminology. That's the official terminology of children in foster care who escape it. And the way in which most systems deal with that is to call the police on them. Mm -hmm. And many children who have fled foster care end up in juvenile detention. So that's just, that's just one way. There are lots of others as well. But why is it? that for so many people, those statistics have been around. We've known for a long time that being in foster care is, you know, as they say, a risk factor. You know, you know, these researchers have been saying this for 30 years at least, and a risk factor for incarceration. But the reason why they, they don't then say, okay, this is a dangerous system, we need to abolish it, is goes back to what you were saying, Timber, about deviancy and culpability. Because they say, but these children were already damaged, 
you know, and deviant before they came into foster care. And that explains why. Uh, and, and then there's also this deep devaluation of black families that is so clear in, you know, mainstream conferences and scholarship and research that black children are so badly off in their families and communities, whatever the foster care system does to them is better than what would have happened to them. So people, you know, people hear those statistics, 80% of people in prison are in foster care and they, and they think, well, if they hadn't been in foster care, they'd all be in prison. You know, that's, that's the kind of thinking with these, these racist assumptions that underlie it. And we have to uproot all of that. You know, we have to uproot all of that to get, get people to see that uh, this is not a form of service you know, <laughs> to black communities as um, many researchers still to this day. I, I mean, there are articles coming out now, right? I don't know if you've seen some of them, you know, right now saying, the children, there are so many black children in foster care because they need to be there. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, which is why it's so important your intervention in terms of kind of what family abolitionists can say to prison abolitionists. Mm -hmm. This that like wait, defund. It's not refund. It's not refund another system. It's not. It's not like you know. It's a little bit like in, in the defund debate when the idea is, you know, the police officers are not going to get paid by the NYPD. They're going to be paid by the Department of Education. It's like, well, wait a minute. Really, is have we really made much of a change here? No. Right. You know, and it's the same thing, like defund the police, the police, but give it to child protective services. Again, it's just like we're not we're not making progress here. Um, and because these systems are and you did a really brilliant job, Dorothy, of, of talking about the ways in which it's these parallels in these or, or, ordeal processes. It's the parallels in, of what they do. And you, 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 you raised a few of them, which is worth picking off and it's yeah. worth kind of like going over again, right? Design, designed to maintain essentially a racial hierarchy. So it has, in some sense, a similar design. It doesn't malfunction, neither malfunctions. It has, it is, accomplishing its task, right? That's a second important way in which these are, these they work together there, but they're also parallel. And, and you know, Timber, in your spoken words, when you were talking about the fact that, you know, followed by acquittal after acquittal after acquittal after acquittal, you said, right? Well, of course, that is the proper functioning of the system, right? I mean, we get upset about it. We get upset that there isn't, you know, responsibility being imposed on 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 someone who commits homicide like this. But of course, that's the way the system is supposed to be working. It, it, that that so 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 the the astonishment should be should it should not be astonishment. It should be well. Of course, we never should have expected that the system would have you know done this. But so the malfunctioning, the the way in which uh, you were saying, Dorothy, that. Again, the the reform is part of the pro has always been part of the project since the beginning, right? And the way in which prison has always been for 150 years, 200, 200 years, right? As as Foucault was saying, you know, reform has been part of the prison since it was invented. And in the same way in which all of the reform work you've done, Dorothy, is kind of like it's it's been part of the system. It, it keeps it going. That's what uh, breathes it. The, that's a Third thing, I thought the fourth thing was this way. No, no more though. No more. I got. No I hear more. you. I hear you. <laughs> I hear you. I've learned my lesson. Building a different society in a second. Yeah. Um, but go on. The 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 fourth thing is the way in which kind of like the pathology of the parents is parallel to the pathology of the delinquent, right? The the way we we create the notion the the way that the prison creates the notion of the delinquent is similar as the way in which the family regulation system creates the notion of the pathology of, yes. of the parent. And then also a fifth thing that was in at the beginning, actually, when you were talking about um, the, the Stanford Law Review article, actually, uh, we, tra we, have it? It down, we traced it down. It's in the chat uh, box and it's by, um, uh, it was uh, Professor Jane Spivak was gonna join us in a second. Uh, she was, it's uh, by Josh Gupta Kagan, America's Hidden yeah. Foster Care System, 72. Yeah. With the, uh, 
cite in there, 72 Stanford Law Review 841. Now that notion of a, a shadow system is of course, all of these all of these ordeals, whether it's the prison and the carceral or the mental health in the 1930s and 40s and 50s, it had, it, they always have all of these multiple institutions that go by all of these various names. You know, I mean, when I was doing the research on um, uh, uh, mental hospitals, right? You know, in the, in, the, in, the early, in the early 20th century, it had all these places for imbeciles, quote unquote, mm -hmm. places for, you know, uh, all, of the, all of the different names. Feeble-minded like, was one of them. Feeble, exactly, feeble-minded, um, you know, all, you know it, today we can hardly even say some of the words that were yeah. used at the time to talk about these institutions. Mm -hmm. um, but the networks of them, when you kind of bring them all together, you see how extraordinarily expansive and kind of tentacular they are. Yeah. Um, so that was that was really, really helpful and something we need to keep an eye on. The other thing we definitely need to be talking about is the idea of building this other society that you're talking about. So I, I want us to spend some more time uh, yeah. talking about that. The, I, had, I had one question for you specifically yeah. tying back to prison abolition or actually tying back to abolition constitutionalism. Mm -hmm. um, so I'm gonna, I'm gonna pose that question, but before I do, I'm also gonna say, so we've got a bunch of uh, great folks who are on the webinar who, who, um, who I've been noticing kind of multitasking, trying to see who's coming in. And I, Jane's, mm -hmm. Professor Jane Spinak, Professor Carol Sanger, Judy Green, Maddie Kurtz are here. There are many more. We're gonna, I'm gonna ask everyone to kind of turn on their, their videos and kind of participate in the conversation. Um, anybody who's, as an attendee, um, uh, hi Jane, uh, anyone who's an attendee who wants to come in, it, we're doing this as a webinar, so you just have to send an email to, to uh, text or whatever it is, chat to Fonda and she can get you in so that you can turn on your video and it make, works well. Um, but I wanted to ask one question, then maybe we can open it up. Jane, maybe you can ask the next one. Um, I'm interested, I was particularly interested in the relationship to the abolition constitutionalism piece, which is brilliant, uh, absolutely brilliant, Dorothy. Um, because what you do there is you give a kind of a new, uh, a, a different reading, a different historical reading of the 13th Amendment uh, as it applies particularly to these institutions like convict leasing was the mm -hmm. particular institution that you, you were discussing that, um, that we, like the, the revisionist history is, oh, the 13th Amendment allowed this. Um, and, and you want to create a re-revisionist. You want to go back to the original kind of what was the debate at the time. And the debate at the time was actually a 13th Amendment to get rid of, or at least, you know, Sumner and other senators wanted to get rid of these institutions of convict leasing. So that offers us a, a, a new way of reading the 13th Amendment, which I think is could be helpful to punishment writ large. In other words, to the way in which we interpret the Eighth Amendment today. Um, so some of these institutions, which we've historically thought were constitutional, uh, could possibly no longer be constitutional. These could be attacked from a from a Thirteenth Amendment perspective okay. or something like that. But, but I was also so that's so I don't know. We, maybe we keep that for the return to the prison abolition conversation, but here, family policing, how does family policing fit in that? In other words, was there a dimension of um, any of this uh, that was a part of the debates over the reconstruction amendments, et cetera, that would be helpful here in this particular domain? You know? Yeah, so, um, so let me, I, I do wanna, uh, say a little bit about the my 13th Amendment argument because I, I want to make it clear that white Southerners did use the 13th Amendment as an excuse to basically re-enslave Black people through convict leasing and incarceration. Mm -hmm. So it, it there is something to the argument that the uh, 13th Amendment has been used, you know, the exclusion for people who are convicted of crimes has been used as a way to re-enslave, re-subjugate Black people through prisons, 
so so that's true and and there are many um you know many people prison abolitionists and others who have made the argument that the 13th amendment uh had this um this this uh mechanism for re-enslaving black people despite the fact that uh it it uh, asserted that it was uh, ending chattel slavery. My point though, in, in the article, is that that was a misuse of the 13th Amendment. And I emphasize that the framers of the 13th Amendment were inspired by anti-slavery abolitionists who certainly did not intend for the 13th Amendment to re-enslave Black people. Uh, and that there is, uh, uh, if you look at the debates over it, that the Republican, the radical Republicans uh, who pushed through the 13th, 14th and 15th Amendments did not intend for black people to be mass incarcerated. In fact, you, you, all, you have to remember that at the time, it was <laughs> during slavery, black people were not incarcerated at high rates. White people were far more likely to be incarcerated. Then rapidly that changed dramatically with the imposition of black codes that were designed to pick up black men and women uh, and put them into prison and contract them out as exploited labor. Mm -hmm. uh, so- And disenfranchised. Uh, so, so yes, yeah, so, uh, so there's, you know, there, there's, there is something to the argument about the 13th Amendment's exception for uh, incarcerate, you know, for people convicted of crime it was used uh, as the constitution was used. I mean, part of what I argue in, in the book is that, and, and I mean, in my article, is that ever since reconstruction and the, and the demise, the violent overthrow of reconstruction, white people, white judges and legislators have used the constitution to subjugate black people and not as an abolitionist document. And my argument in the article is that we should instrumentally, you know, we should uh, in various ways, even just to point out the hypocrisy as George Jackson did during his trial, you know, where he, he, he said, you know, you, we need to use the constitution to point out the hypocrisy of uh, the, the pigs that are have incarcerated me. So there, my, my argument is to go back to the original abolitionist approach to the constitution that, uh, that black people and their ally, white allies in the abolitionist movement, uh, their ideas for the constitution. And I also argue that we should that abolitionists should create an ab you know a new constitution, whether that's amendments of the constitution, whether it's a completely new constitution, constitution in the sense that it reflects the values of our society. And if we're building a new society, right, that is uh, that that is a free society, we should also be working on a constitution uh, broadly defined in the same way that Frederick Douglass, you know, he, he advocated for a different interpretation of the constitution that opposed slavery, even though every single judge who'd ever interpreted the constitution of the United States said it supported slavery. Right. So, um, so that's my argument there. Now, in terms of family policing, and thanks for that question, uh, I, I have to say, I haven't really thought, well, I shouldn't say I haven't thought about it. I haven't gotten to the book, yet, <laughs> my last chapters of the book yet, where I've written about how, um, what uh, family policing, abolition, you know, all of what it looks like. But 
what your question brings to mind is the work of Peggy Cooper Davis at NYU, who has long written about how, uh, the, the, again, the 14th Amendment, the, that the, the framers of the 14th Amendment uh, and the, um, the, the ideas of liberty and due process were influenced by testimonies of formerly enslaved people who, who testified about how the slavery system broke up their families. Uh, this, this was a major part of the terror and harm and violence of slavery was the alleged ownership of, of children by enslavers and their ability to control the fate of children without any regard for their parents whatsoever. Uh, that, that was incomprehensible. The white plantation enslaver thought of himself as the head of the plantation family and he owned everybody. On, on the plantation. You know, he owned the African people who were enslaved. He owned black women's children before they were even born in the womb. Mm -hmm. he, he, he owned them, he could control them. He could decide that they were going to be sold off while still in the womb. So the moment they were born, they could be taken away. Uh, at, at any point, they could be taken away from their parents. You know, even as I speak now, it's, it's just, it's so much like the current police and family policing system. And so if we look to that testimony of free black people about what was important to them, you know, it, it was important to vote. <laughs> It was important to be able to own their own property, right? It was important not to have to comply with the orders of white enslavers. It was important to not be considered human chattel, but it was also really important to them to be able to raise their own children and have uh, be able to make decisions about their families without the intervention of white people telling them what to do. Right. And so uh, I think there is a, a strong argument. And again, I, ref I refer to a, a scholarship by Professor Davis um, uh, on this connection between the Reconstruction Amendments and the violence against black families uh, during the slavery era. Mm -hmm. Yeah, right, right, right. That would really be interesting to, to fit it in as a piece of kind mm -hmm. of the, the, as an integral piece to the whole debate over the rights associated with the 13th Amendment effectively. Yes. Yeah. Right, we could tell, well, of course they were, they were a piece together, you know, they were, the 13th, 14th and 15th Amendments were right. uh, enacted close together and were seen, we, we call them the Reconstruction Amendments. Right. Right. Um, another thing I would say, and I, I wrote about this in, in Shattered Bonds, is the, the what goes on with the family policing system violates even current notions of, of constitutional rights. I mean, we, we don't even have to think about an abolitionist approach and it's, you know, to the constitution. I mean, we should, but I'm saying even without getting there, there's such blatant violation of rights. So the, the idea of family integrity is a foundation of liberal democracy. If the family is, and, and it's been the, the very first due process cases in the United States were cases involving parental rights to raise their children without state interference. So there's a deep, deep constitutional jurisprudence on the importance of families 
and the and protection against state interference. That just doesn't, you know, people just don't think it applies to black families. Mm -hmm. it, it's, right. I, I, again, it's the, the way in which black families have for so long been portrayed as innately defective. Mm -hmm. um, and that now I'm thinking of, you know, my, another hat I wear and writing about the biological concept of race and the idea that black people are a separate innately inferior race. And that come, you know, even when people aren't talking about um, the, uh, you know, when I say people, policymakers and state agents aren't referring to some kind of genetic inferiority, although some scientists do still, there is this idea of black parents passing down, especially black mothers passing down a defective um, uh, uh, deviant lifestyle to their children that requires state intervention. And this gets, but you know, in Killing the Black Body, I write about the, the very brutal sterilization programs to keep black mothers from having children based on these ideas, welfare policies today that are intended to deter black mothers who are receiving welfare benefits from having children. And we hear it also in anti-immigration rhetoric uh, that you know, Mexican women shouldn't come into the United States and have children. And this brings me to something else that Timber mentioned that I that in in you know in Timber in your um, uh, your performance, your original, your how you began it. Uh, and you're focusing on black men and boys. And uh, I've been very aware of how the child, the, the child welfare, the family policing system is so concentrated on black mothers. Uh, but, but a piece of that is the way in which black men are treated as if they are irrelevant to families. <laughs> Mm -hmm. uh, and uh, black mothers are treated as if they're they're bad for for children. They're bad parents. They 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 are a bad influence on their children. They're pathological. They have all sorts of deficits. And black fathers are generally assumed to be absent. Um, I, I remember uh, some time ago speaking with a, a, a lawyer representing um, uh, a family that was involved in the child welfare system. Actually, she was representing the children um, and uh, she was in the record, there was no mention of the father of these children. And uh, she assumed the father had nothing to do with them. And uh, I can't remember all the details now, but at some point she was able to track down the father and uh, invite him to a meeting with the children. And when he walked in the room, the children go, daddy, daddy, we miss you. you know? and she, was, she was astounded because she thought that, that, that this father was completely non-existent, you know? And so that's often the way that black men are treated by the by state agents they're they're seen as sources of child support um, or uh, or bad assumed to be harmful to children so one place where they come in is where uh, the children have been removed and one of the requirements may be, that the father cannot be present in the home. Uh, and so, uh, and, and that may not be because there's any evidence that he's ever done anything to harm the children. And maybe because he has a criminal record. So this is another connection because of the racism in the criminal legal system that targets black people 
you know, and large numbers of black men and boys, uh, it, it has an impact on families because it, there's an assumption that if you have criminal uh, legal involvement, you're dangerous to children. Well, that leaves out a big swath of the black community and it makes it harder for black mothers to get, uh, to get their kids back because they're more likely to be involved with men who have been involved in the criminal legal system. Right, right, right. Thanks, thanks, Dorothy. Um, let's, uh, Jane, do you wanna jump in? And I should say, uh, or uh, if, if you wanted to, also we've got a number of other people. So I, I'd like our, our students to come live. I know there are a lot of questions there. Um, uh, Fonda, if you could help, uh, there's Bobby Butts who also wants to come live. So if you can make him a panelist and uh, others, so students come on live. I've also got some questions in the Q and A that I do want to get to. Um, Jane, you are so uh, Jane Spinak, professor here at Columbia Law School. You're going to be uh, hosting the, you're chair, co-chairing the um, the conference with uh, with Professor Nancy Polikoff, right? So um, uh, go ahead. This this <laughs> kind of this whole this this uh, abolition ten thirteen is a little bit of a preview or a. a, a, a <laughs> or something. To, uh, Preview uh, for you, Dorothy. <laughs> yeah, hi, Jane. It's so good to see you. It's so good to see you. And thank you for sending the picture of your granddaughter. <laughs> <laughs> I, I had special people. I, I better, Bernard, have I sent you a photo yet? I better send you one. <laughs> <laughs> Only certain people. <laughs> so, uh, so just a couple of things. One is I wanted to thank Timber for, for that amazing presentation. Um, I don't know if you are connected at all with Represent Magazine in New York, but I am going to, that a group of writers who write about being in foster care, but I'm going to send the editor your, all your information. Um, and I do hope you and and people you're involved with with will come to the conference. That would be great. Um, so Dorothy, I think I'm going to put you on the spot a little bit um, because you said I'm not yet at the last chapters, <laughs> and of course you know that I'm working on a book about family court and abolishing it. Yeah. And I'm getting to the last chapters <laughs> and hoping that the conference is gonna help me get there. Yeah. Um, but yet it happens that um, yesterday, Michael Walda and I were talking through some hard issues around what gets built instead yeah. and and um you know we were we were talking in part about the those those small number of cases that are really complicated and problematic but today I want to ask you more about in general how we recreate not recreate, how we create a different kind of system. Mm -hmm. So, you know, one of the things you said was community and certainly, as you know, being in New York and the development of um, such a strong advocacy community among parents and among youth, yeah. Um, has really changed in many ways how we think about the system. Mm -hmm. So a piece of it is, is how that strength gets drawn into decision making. Yes. And then, but also um, one of the things that Michael and I were talking about is how do you situate solutions in communities that are legitimate, mm -hmm. that are in places where, where the involved people mm -hmm. will feel it's safe to go, it's 
helpful to go. Mm -hmm. um, it's, it's not going to result in reporting. Um, it's going to result in support, not unlike the kinds of reports done by the advisory board for abuse and neglect in the 1990s, yeah. talking about how do we create a neighborhood system, yeah. not what then came. Um, and so I am curious about your, at, at least some of your initial thoughts mm -hmm. about how we help to construct such a such a, a kind of support system, particularly, mm -hmm. and this was another thing he and I were talking about, when you can't, um, you can't ameliorate mm -hmm. all of the issues around inequities and, and economic disparities and structural racism. I mean, they're not gonna disappear because we've created this other thing. So, how do we make it legitimate yeah. even while we're working on those other issues? Yeah. So my first question is what legitimate by whose standards and what does that mean? Because I, I think for so long, and you've, you've highlighted this, this issue that it's been legitimate by the standards of the very system that's right you know, that's inflicting the violence. Right. So um, one reason why reforms haven't worked is because they've so often been part of the system itself. Right. And, uh, and that creates the problem you mentioned that you don't know if you are participating in this alternative that you're not gonna be reported and right. end up in the very system that supposedly this alternative was an alternative to. Right. Um, and so one, uh, I, I think one principle is that uh, the, the work of establishing, building community uh, uh, resources and strategies and ways of addressing families' needs and, um, and, and problems and including violence in families just can't be connected to the state, you know, child welfare system. It, it can't, right. um, I, I mean, that's a, I think for some people that's a, that's a, a radical notion that's <laughs> impossible to perceive, but I have come to that conclusion. Yeah. Uh, because I've seen so many times where, especially your parent organizers who had a vision and were struggling to put it into place, they end up having to work with the child welfare authorities because they don't have any resources. Right. They're offered, you know, resources that they'd say, well, let's try it. And they end up <laughs> being agents of the of the system and and have feeling they have to spout what the child welfare authorities want them to say and do or they're going to lose their contract so it's a you know I don't want to I, I don't at all want to blame anybody or right. judge anybody for how they feel they have to well operate but I think one one principle though is to, that there has to be a true separation from the system or else it, it's going to be absorbed into it. Um, so well, <laughs> I also think I also think one of the challenges, um, I've been amazed at how many times over the 20th century mm -hmm. um, there really was an attempt to to decouple. Yeah um the the system so that there was community based i, I yeah. for example in the juvenile justice task force that was part of the johnson criminal commission they said yeah it it may not work but we know what's happening now in juvenile justice isn't working so 
maybe we should try it. Yeah. And I think it's a real leap for people to let go. Yeah, it is. It is. I mean, that's, that's one of the, I, I think the um, challenges of this work that, but it's, it's essential that we do it is getting people to be willing to take that leap. Right. The thing, the thing is, this is something I'm, I'm doing in, in writing my book is pointing out all the ways that the system doesn't work. It harms, it harms, it doesn't help people. Um, I, I, you know, Joyce McMillan, who you probably know, who um, is a, a fierce abolitionist organizer in New York, I think she put she put up that uh, poster, I believe, about yeah, how she, she did. <laughs> um, you know, and and she uh, she points out that before she got involved, she was fine. It was getting involved in the system that hurt her children, that hurt her, you know, impoverished her, uh, ended up with her children being harmed, uh, and uh, and this is. There's just so many examples of that. I have this working on shattered bonds, working with mo mostly black mothers, go going with them, you know, to court with them, to agency hearings, looking at their records, reading about this, looking at when you get deep into it, I, I came away thinking that these families would be better off without this system at all. Right. You know, and there's no, the, the evidence is that, that so often, you know, the stories we hear about are stories where the child welfare system missed or failed to protect children. That's what you hear about in the news. You hardly ever hear about all the harm they're inflicting on families. And it, it, there's a little bit more of it now, but what is, what is it about this system that misses egregious cases of child abuse and then spends most of its time intervening harmfully in families where the children should never have been taken away? It doesn't work. And, and this is the same thing with prisons. Prisons have not worked to stop violence, to stop harm. They cause much more harm than they have uh, allegedly stopped. Mm -hmm. They don't even address the main harms, just like family policing. So it, but it seems harder for people to be willing to say, we need to stop this and we need to create something completely different. It's just, mm -hmm. it, it's harder, I find. <laughs> it's harder to get people to do that with child protection because they're afraid that children aren't gonna be protected. And I think they believe the, the hype that all these parents are what's harming children. I think it's easier for people to believe that. So, for, so um, for lots of reasons. Mm -hmm. And we we have to do that. Let me just say also, Jane, to your question, the way I am writing my last chapter is not to give all the answers to these <laughs> questions because I don't have all. It really is to hold up the organizing that's going on and to say, we need to support it. And I think that this is a long process that um, of, of work that we have to uh, we we have to engage in, but I do like how we ended up in our dialogue that 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 part of a uh, essential part of it is being willing. Uh, I like what what you said to take that leap, mm -hmm. but it's it's not a it's not an irrational leap. It's a leap based on what we know is harmful and what has been designed to be harmful. Mm -hmm. We know that. So, uh, so let's do the hard work, which you know I think your discussion with Michael Wald is, is part of that, to figure out how we can build these community-based uh, 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 approaches and, and resources and mutual aid that is decoupled from the system as, 
mm-hmm. and, and the authorities that have been so harmful. Mm-hmm. This is this is a great conversation, and I, it takes us to one of the questions from the attendees that I really think is like right directly on it, and I think like it deserves a a, a yes or no answer. Oh. In way, you know what I mean? <laughs> um, and and then and then and then we're gonna go to uh, Bobby Butts. But before, like, let's let's pose this question, right? Does yeah. Dorothy have any advice, comments for a social worker who wants to work within the foster care system while attempting to dismantle its deeply embedded racist yeah. institution from within? Or does working within that system continue to perpetrate that harm, right? Okay, yeah. I mean, it's a question that, you know, I'm used to in the kind of criminal justice context, in the, you know, death penalty representation context, but, yeah. um, and, Yes or no, uh, Dorothy? You know what I mean? It's hard to get. It's hard to give a yes or no answer to that. Um, and and the question was for advice. It wasn't to give a yes or no answer. Okay, you're right. Um, you're right. You're right. I, I would. <laughs> so this is the 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 family policing system is a system that makes it extremely hard for people working in it, regardless of their good intentions, to uh, to provide real care for families. Uh, and I'm sure whoever asked the question knows that. I, I bet you that whoever asked the question, uh, if they're if they're not a, a supervisor, you know, that they've gone to a supervisor asking for some kind of support that would help a family, like, you know, for example, just getting housing, you know, for a family who's is going to be split up just because they don't have housing and the supervisor says, sorry, we can't provide that, go take the children out. Uh, you know, I, I, I have talked to uh, social workers who've had answers like that given to them. And, uh, you know, what, what do you do then? I think it's, it's very difficult then if you are forced to go with a police officer into someone's home and take their children away when the reason, when you know that what would help the family is getting them housing. Now, Mm -hmm. there, I've also talked to people working in the system who've said, I have been able to help families because I've gotten them housing. Um, one example of that is, for example, the, the Bronx defenders and the Brooklyn defenders, they have social workers who work with family defense attorneys to uh, get that kind of needed support to families, but they're working, <laughs> they're working, you know, for family defenders, they're not working in the system. Mm-hmm. Um, I guess I would say go work for for the the law the family defenders because right. there are those positions right. where right. social workers are now teaming with lawyers and others to uh, to get the kinds of supports to families that they need so that children aren't taken away right. from right. home. So I would I would say explore that as well. Right. Um, and so- I. Also know that social that social there are radical social workers who are um, uh, organizing to make a change as well. Um, it's 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 a it's a it's a tough it's a tough question. Um, I would. I wish Joy. Uh, maybe Joyce McMillan would would say, "No, get out of there right now." I try to. I try to channel Joyce because she knows so well, having been in the system and working with, uh, you know, trying to change it. Um, what is what can work and what can't? Um, so. You know, it's a it's a similar question about prosecutors. Right, the progressive prosecutor issue is pretty I, is is the same almost, right? It's very, I mean, you know. Yeah, it's very much the same. Um, you know, and again, I I, I would say, 
that it's very unlikely that prosecutors are gonna be able to make much of a change. I mean, I can say mm -hmm. personally, uh, I have decided that I am gonna work with organizers who are trying to dismantle the system. And I have, uh, I'm very reluctant to have anything to do with the system. I mean, I've, I've, um, I've just made the decision that I want to work with people like Joyce McMillan. You know, I want to work with people like Movement for Family Power. I want to work with people like Timber Hudson. Um, and that's the decision I've made for myself. And I suppose if I were to have, uh, you know, not pronounce anything, I, I really feel like I, I don't want to make pronouncements <laughs> because I, I prefer to work with people who have similar values and mission as I do to work this out. Um, but if I were meeting one-on-one -on -one with someone in that situation, I would probably encourage them to leave and, uh, and work with family defenders, for example. But again, I, I don't wanna pronounce on what all social workers should do. I feel the same way with, uh, you know, with, with students. If they, if they come to me and say, should I work with the defenders or should I work for the prosecutor? I'm gonna say work with the defenders. Mm -hmm. um, so mm -hmm. I, I, I don't wanna, I think that's more likely to lead to change. I don't, um, I, I don't wanna make a pronouncement against progressive prosecutors, you know, but I think that uh, for me, yeah. I uh, support the uh, family defenders like Jane Spinak and uh, others who are working to uh, defend the families that are up against this terroristic system. Yeah. 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 I think it's, I think it's, I'm, 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 I think it's more clear in the kind of progressive prosecutor context that, you know, th th there's a real, you know, boy, just go be a defender. Right. I mean, if you want to be, <laughs> progressive, you know what I mean? Yeah. And, and then the question becomes in a situation like this, you know, whether, whether, yeah, no, uh, no. It's yeah, it's, it probably depends on um, exactly what you're doing. But I, I'm telling you, if you're in it, there is so much pressure on you to act according to the carceral logics, regardless of what you want to do. What are you going to do if you take the example I gave, which is a real example you know, I, I, it, this is a real life example that happens all the time. And the, the social worker knows that the family needs heat, the family needs food, the family needs housing, uh, the family needs transportation, uh, the family needs better health care. You know, we could go down the list. That's, that would, that's, that's what's needed. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And the and that separate taking the children away is going to harm those children, mm -hmm. and the solution would be short term. You know, of course, the solution long term is not to live in a nation that has homelessness and poverty and a lack of health care and all of that. But it, but right now, uh, the solution is to get the family those material resources that they need. And they are told by the supervisor, we cannot do that. Go get the children right, right now because they're living in a car right. and it's cold outside. Right. What is the social worker gonna do? Right, right, right. <laughs> you know, it's... Yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> I, I, I to get a and the and the family doesn't doesn't want to be separated. 
Right. And they're fighting against it. Are you going to go call the cops to come with you to forcibly separate them? That's what you're called to do. Right. Let me let me give another example. I don't want to, you know, that we all have to think about, which is mandated reporting. Right. Federal law requires that states have mandated reporting laws. And uh, their, their states have all sorts of categories of people that are required to report their suspicions of child abuse and neglect. Uh, there are people right now, it's not just social workers, it's doctors, it's teachers. Uh, it's people working in social service agencies other than CPS. Right. that have to decide what, what am I going to do? But the thing is, see, I, this, is for, this is what I have learned from working with organized. This is why you, can, you have to work with people who are on the ground trying to stop this. You know, don't report them. Mm -hmm. Don't report. It's, it's harmful. You do not have to be an agent of the state. Mm -hmm. Figure out something else. Work to help solve the problem. Don't report. Doctors, and the thing, this is the other thing. Take the example of drug use during pregnancy. This is something I've been working on for 30 years now, right? It's the same as when I started working on it. Hospitals that serve Black communities routinely report mothers who test positive for drugs or their newborns who test positive for drugs. The New York City Human Rights Commission is looking into this right now in New York because this is going on. Whereas hospitals that serve wealthier white people do not routinely report. So it's not, it's not as if mandated reporting is some kind of fair and you know, caring way that we can stop child maltreatment. It's, it works in an extremely racist and classist way and sexist way. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And that is a sign that it's not really about protecting children. So if we're concerned about drug use during pregnancy, the way we need to figure out a better way to address it than how we're addressing it now through criminal prosecutions and taking children away from their mothers, which is harmful. And it's, and it's, not, and it's not the case that because there's a positive drug result that the parents can't take care of the children. It's certainly not the case that those children are better off removed as newborns from their mothers. So in, in, let the, we have to think, think through this as, you know, as Jay said, take the leap to think critically about, about this. Don't just knee jerk response because of myths that have been circulating uh, about how children are protected in the United States. Right. Or following orders, right? Or following orders. <laughs> yeah. Um, yeah. Let me let me invite uh, Bobby Butts. Welcome. Um, one of the great things about having this kind of public seminar is that we get to meet new people. Uh, tell us a little bit about your organization and, and tell us what you wanted to talk about or pose. Okay. So my name is Bobby Butts. I am a project coordinator with Star Nova Inc. And we have a project called Family Unification, Equity, and Empowerment, which looks into the barriers that stop formerly incarcerated people from reunifying with their loved ones that are lost or languishing in CPS because of the war on drugs and the stigma that they have against Black people. Yeah. And, uh, just permanently separating black and brown children. And so we live in a, like a conservative county here, mm -hmm. but I, I do do 
uh, do work with a uh, movement family power, Josephine Millen. I love her so much. <laughs> uh, she's amazing. I call her anytime I'm, I'm trying yep. to figure it out. Uh, yep. the ladies, uh, my boss, Vanya Corals, um, you know, she birthed this project because uh, she has been a part of the foster care system for generations, had to get her grandchildren as me as well. I had to navigate the system for six years mm -hmm. and I didn't want to leave my kids in there because they're dark skinned like me. And I could just only imagine uh, what they would go through mm -hmm. um, and, you know, what I went through without even being in the system, mm -hmm. you know, with my skin color. So I stayed in the race with my children um, so and it took me six years, and so uh, just working with parents, helping them navigate uh, the child dependency court throughout the United States. Um, free, uh, we have a Facebook, uh, we have some surveys and stuff. Um, if y'all don't mind, I can send y'all something later on. My email. Um, yeah. Also, pop it in the chat. Maybe you could yeah. pop it. In the okay, chat. yeah. I'm, I was so excited. Yeah. Right? I'm over here like shaking, like, oh, Bobby, I'm so happy. I love you, you. Miss Roberts. I love you, Miss Roberts. Oh, I love you. I, I love, love everybody you. on this call. I love everybody who is dedicated to making sure that we're not permanently separated. I have no idea. My phone wants to uh, <laughs> dial and call everybody. Everybody wants to call me now, and I don't get caught. <laughs> no. <laughs> So, um, I just want to say uh, the racial disparities and the disproportionalities that are taking place and how, uh, you know, we have to donate Vaseline and hair grease to the CPS offices so our children can get some type of proper care. It's a culture difference, but um, every time I think about you, Ms. Robert, I just think, when I heard that recording, she said, those babies belong with us, right? So I just, I was, <laughs> right? So, so, so I'm just want people to heal, right? I don't want to keep the cycle going. Like you guys said, it's making us vulnerable to uh, another system that is uh, meant to keep us. Mm -hmm. um, and I just, um, I just want to say um, I love everything about you, Miss Roberts, all those people, Movement Family Power, National Incarcerated for Women and Girls, starting over a new way of life, time for change, legal services, prisoners, children. You. Oh, oh, I almost forgot. Yeah. So um, we got a bill going on out here in California, which I'm out here in California, called SB 354. It's a foster care youth placement, and it's supposed to make some of the non-exemptables exemptable so people can get their kids placed, and maybe it'll slow down to them removing children from the home and trying to uh, start addressing the root issues uh, that need to be addressed on what, what brought the CPS to. Mm -hmm. And then uh, you talked about the uh, mandate reporters. Um, I work for 211 in... I took the mandate reporter and it's like, it's up, it's up to the person. And like you said, community, if you see a child in need and you know a parent might don't wanna be bothered with you or whatever, the kids will take it. Take it, take the stuff the kids need. They need shoes, they need clothes, mm -hmm. they need food, cook them a meal. Mm -hmm. Take them over there, get them some resources, get them some real time resources. Mm -hmm. right. um, I come, I don't mean to be sad in our alley or anything, but <laughs> I'm just me. <laughs> I'm so glad you joined us. See, I like this because Bobby, you are confirming what I had to say in case people thought I was making it up. I'm just so glad that you joined and I'm so grateful for your work. I'm gonna keep in touch with you. Great. Yes, I'm so grateful for my boss uh, taking a chance on me and thinking I, I uh, deserve this leadership position. Mm -hmm. and so um, I know as time comes, um, I will probably be leaning on because some of my parents' cases, by the time most of my parents get to me, their rights have been terminated. 
And when we look at the denial, it's because of their criminal convictions or their history, or, you know, they've been in jail so long, their kids been adopted out. Um, like for me, my kids stayed in the system for six years because majority of my family have criminal convictions, mm-hmm. especially the ones I trusted, the ones I kept, that knew could take care of my children. And, you know, they've tried before my my mom, my dad, they both passed away. They weren't able to get them. My Auntie Rita, my Uncle Dickie, they passed away, not able to get their own grandkids. You know, just um, I know so many people around me that has been affected by the CPS, you know, and when my heart breaks when my boss says she's going on almost four generations. Mm. So for the last 30 years, they have been permanently or some somehow some way adding more vulnerability to um, a race that is only three fifths to them yeah since we're here uh we need to speak up i know my boss she went out there to australia and i was reading some of their stuff and they the aborigine they didn't even have no family of uh, reunification mm-hmm. you know and it's just you know um mm. yeah you know, yeah and if then I, the community. Oh, go ahead. No, I just I just wanted to to accentuate what you were saying about four generations of black families being involved in in this system. And to me, that shows you what a failure it is. If it's so great for children, then how is it that the next generation gets involved too? That's the system's fault. It's structured to do that. That that's not because of the parents. So the that to me is just one of the examples of how we know that this is a system designed to harm families. It's not designed to protect children. No, um, I was a part of Women's Organizing for Justice Opportunity, a new way of life with Susan Burton. Oh yeah. Um, yeah. Oh, Joe, right? Yeah. And so they had showed us like the parallels of, you know, we read uh, about how some slaves said, you know, last time they seen their mom, uh, she was going to the left and they was going to the right. Mm-hmm. They don't know who they come from. They, you know, the 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 transcendent love, like, you know, um, uh, you know, your grandbaby, Miss Roberts, got your notes. Right, but when she go to another place, like Joyce McMillan says, the texture is different. The air, yeah. Yeah. you know, and if the family is not up to par in their heart, they will uh, mistreat the child mm-hmm. without even knowing they're mistreating the child. Mm-hmm. You know, and so it's like give families a chance. Okay, I'm not saying excuse what we did, mm-hmm. right? But what I'm saying is give my family a chance to give my kids. If I'm not going to get well fast enough, if I'm not going to get clean fast enough, if I'm not going to get a job fast enough, if I'm not going to get my mental fast enough, I still should know my kids are at all times and that they're safe. And when they're in a system, they can be moved from here to there without you even knowing. They can be put on medication. They can be all the yeah it's crazy mm-hmm. yeah. thank you bobby thank you for for uh for sharing that with us i know that um timber you were nodding in a way that uh you wanted in so let me let me turn it to you i was just gonna add thank you bobby <laughs> that, yes <laughs> one of the things that always stand out to me when having discussions similar to these or about this is that like um like you mentioned whenever that termination happens or when that separation happens. Well, one thing I'll say about me and my personal experience, I feel that the system, well, when I was in the system, the system never worked more effectively than when it was working to terminate my family's rights. Once my family's rights were terminated, I stopped being engaged through court. Uh, My lawyers changed and I didn't know who it was. My social worker changed. I didn't know who it was. The monthly visits were no more, were no longer important and so on. And so like 
like um, Professor Robert said, the system is designed to do exactly what it's supposed to do. Um, after my rights were, after my family's rights were terminated, I was, you know, kind of teased with this idea of adoption. Uh, meanwhile, I was put in a room with a bunch of other children that were lighter, most of them white, and I was consistently picked over. And like, what does that do to a child? Yeah. What does that do to a child when you tell them to get ready, we're going to an adoption party and, you know, potentially find a family and there's 70 kids there and seven kids are left and they're all black and look like you. Yeah, you know, that is one of the fallacies of the way that transracial adoption and is used against black families. So there, there's this idea that these children are going to be adopted into white homes. Uh, there are some people like uh, Professor Betsy Bartholet at Harvard, who's actually written that uh, we need to support transracial adoption to uh, address all these black children who have legitimately been taken from their parents and get adopted. And that argument was brought into the passage of the uh, Adoption Safe Families Act, which sped up, I'll put it in you know, condensed terms, sped up termination of parental rights and gave incentives to states to have more children placed for adoption. And some people argued that, well, that will free, and they use it to free black children to be adopted. But it is not the case that most white people who adopt children want to adopt black children. And I'm not, I'm not making a comment about transracial adoption itself. I'm making a comment about the politics around it that uh, somehow black children are going to be saved by being adopted by white people. This, this is an argument that people have made in order to support termination of Black parents' rights, and uh, some explicitly. Uh, and it's certainly implicitly part of the politics around all of this. And uh, you're, you're right, Timber, that uh, it, it, it's promoted as a kind of false hope for Black children. It shouldn't even, that shouldn't even be a hope you know, that shouldn't be the hope for black children to be saved by white people, but it's not even true that they're likely to be adopted by white people. Mm -hmm. And it's just another dimension of, I'm glad you raised it because we haven't really talked about that aspect of it. It's another dimension of the racism in this family policing system and what are seen as solutions for black families not to support the families, but terminate the parents' rights faster and get them adopted, which doesn't happen. Yeah. So um, there's another question. So I've got. I, I want to turn to the question that's in the in the Q and A, and then um, and then uh, Ivan Nicholas uh, wants to bring us back to these the kind of the parallels to the to the border and to mm -hmm. the kind of taking oh, the children yeah. away. Uh, which I think is useful. Um, the question in the in the Q and A is 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 right up our alley. It's about risk prediction. It's about you know the algorithms. And you had you had mentioned it in part in your talk, which is a fascinating point, right? Which is yeah. that you know being in the foster system is a you know risk predictor, right? Um, <laughs> in the same in the same way in which kind of you know. Uh, having been in the criminal justice uh, uh, system is a risk predictor. I mean, when you look at the risk, uh, when you look at the tools that are used for actuarial prediction, they depend so much on prior contacts with the criminal, you know, network, you know, have you been arrested before, whatever. And it's the same thing here, really, in a sense. Um, well, it's not just in a sense. If they actually do that. They, that's one of the variables some of these systems put in for whether children are at risk of child abuse and neglect. So, you know, if, if these are predictive algorithms that are help, supposedly helping child protection services 
determine which children should be, you know, which homes should be investigated, which children should be removed. Right. And given, given that those, those prior, um, those prior variables are infused by race yes. and by the racial profiling in the, in, the, in the policing context and by the racial profiling in the family context, these, yeah. these factors end up being, you know, just a proxy for race, in effect. Yeah. I mean, risk becomes a proxy for race, yes. not only in the criminal system, but here as well in the, in the, in the family policing system, I mm -hmm. take it. Yeah, yeah. Um, so I don't know. I mean, you know, how do you combat? I mean, this powerful group. I mean, you know, it's 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 the it's it puts you on this. It's kind of like this double edged sword where it, in the bail context, we see it all the time right now. Right. You know, you want to get rid of cash. You want to get rid of cash bail. Great. OK, yeah, let's fight to get rid of cash bail replaced with a prediction yeah. tool that has in it kind of embedded racism. Right. Yeah. It's like, well, which one would you prefer? You know, cash. Yes. <laughs> Um, yes, neither. Right, neither. Exactly. Right. I think well, the response. Part, yeah, that's part of why it's important to see these forms of algorithmic surveillance as part of the carceral apparatus, you know, that they can't replace the, right. the, the more direct brutality. What they do is hide it by the supposedly neutral algorithms that actually embed past racial injustice within them. And there's been a lot more work, I think, done on uh, the way in which law enforcement predictions have built in racism but for the reasons you said. You know, <laughs> their predictions are based on prior involvement or living in a neighborhood that's had prior involvement. I mean, some of it is not just involvement. There, there, there are some of these predictors have identified toddlers as gang members, for example. So, um, but we see similar kinds of ways that racism is built into the system with these new um, algorithms to predict child maltreatment or to predict which children are at the greatest risk and therefore need to be removed from their homes. Right. And right. it's, uh, yeah, there's, there's a, it's, there's a, a move now, just like in law enforcement to say that it is possible to figure out tools that do not have racial bias embedded in them. And that's a question that uh, we'll have to grapple with as well. Yeah, yeah. And of course, the other problem is that these tools aren't predicting, I mean, what they're predicting is your vulnerability to being profiled essentially, right? Because of the, what, what, that's what they're predicting. It's exactly. And then when they profile you, they say and find something because you've been profiled and and subject, perhaps, you know, again, to the same discriminatory intervention, then they say, oh, look, it worked. And then your data mm -hmm. gets put into it. Mm -hmm. And now you're just replicating even more mm -hmm. the same racist assumptions that were embedded, but now they're even strengthened mm -hmm. by the way in which the machine has learned and, and, and supported the next intervention. It, it's really, mm -hmm. you're right, it's not a prediction of the future, it's a replication of the past, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. not a prediction of the future. But it does raise the question of whether we can use technologies in a way that can truly help us create something new. Mm -hmm. right, right. Not, not just right. replicate past injustice, but create something new. Right. Uh, Michael, while well, do you want to jump in on this? Uh, so let's get a quick intervention here, then we'll take the last, the last question from Ivan Nicholas and let Dorothy mm -hmm. close us out. 
Uh, you got to turn your volume on though, or unmute or whatever it's called there. Hi, Dorothy. It's Hi, Michael. Michael. It's great to see you. You too. And this is like all, all home week or whatever the term is. With uh, And I look forward to seeing you in uh, a month at the uh, right. Columbia Symposium. Yes. Uh, and I should just say briefly, uh, I, I want to raise two things, but uh, yeah. uh, I, I think Dorothy will back me on, on, <laughs> on the, the brief thing I'll say to begin with. I mean, I've been trying to close this system for 50 years. That's true, uh, yeah. Writing and doing a lot of drafting and stuff. So I want to raise two general questions. Jane raised a third that I've, that I've been thinking about a lot lately and we'll discuss at the Columbia Company. First of all, on the risk assessment instrument, uh, on the risk assessment stuff, I've been actually looking in it at some depth and I actually think there's a lot of indications that the risk assessment stuff in Pittsburgh, in Los Angeles and some of the California actually show most families are low risk and can be used to close the system rather than to incorporate and that the concern and, and that the attacks on risk assessment, which have which do have all these racial and other kinds of problems, are not looking closely at the data as to how this stuff can be used. And in risk assessment instruments, the issue always is compared to what? And the judgments of the social workers are not free of bias yeah. in all of this. And in fact, there's some, uh, there's some evidence that some of the best created risk assessment instruments cure some of the biases that the workers bring into it. So I think uh, all of these are problems that, you know, uh, Having worked in all of this stuff for 50 years and feeling frustrated, as you described, yeah. at how we haven't moved, uh, we would make things worse in many ways, I haven't moved back. I work on a problem that's, uh, that is 70 times worse in terms of reports. And when I try to eliminate the reports then, uh, that we ought to look at, and as you just said, technology might be able to help. And we, we should be looking at every element about this without preconceptions. The other general point I want to raise is that at least when I started uh, working uh, in the system, the families that were in it were actually heavily white. Mm -hmm. And if, in fact, if you look at um, the places where there is the most intervention, like West Virginia, which uh, one in 10 kids every single year uh, come into the system, in, into the child welfare system, uh, that um, they are all white. Uh, and you raised it, Dorothy, in, in your comment. I mean, the separating out uh, of race, which is pervasive in the United States and dominates everything, but the separating out of race and poverty uh, I and mean, as you even pointed out on the on the drug stuff, it's wealthy white uh, yeah. users of drugs who don't get reported. Poor white users of drugs and opioids get reported regularly and removed regularly in state after state. Uh, and thinking about it, I, I mean, I do think the poverty element, and that raises some basic questions, which I find very hard and complicated as to clearly we have to address poverty, but the families that are often in this are in such deep poverty, even the kinds of things that we're talking about now, like children's allowances, are just not going to make uh, that much of a dent and really thinking through how we move politically, what is the end goal uh, that is realistic uh, at, at the same time when there's a lot of push toward putting money into K through 12 systems, putting money into preschool, putting money into all of these other children's programs is a hard thing for advocates in this system. Mm -hmm. Thanks. Uh, uh, Dorothy, before you respond, maybe yeah. um, let's just take the, the, the last piece of it. And uh, Ivan, 
wanted to to jump in. Uh, Ivan, since we're kind of running out of time, um, uh, no, I don't. I, I want your point to come in. I was just going to kind of summarize it, maybe uh, as you had sent it to me, which was basically to to kind of coming back to the question that we in a way we opened with, right? They separate children at the border of Harlem too, right? Yeah. Um, the, the, the comparison to separation at the border, at the Mexican border and, and the, the practices of family separation, I think what Ivan wanted to point to was the way in which there's also this way of taking hostage of children as a tool of oppression, right? In other words, it's not just kind of the separation and the harm there, but also the way in which the system can then be yeah. used as an instrument to of social control in a way. Is that is that a fair, uh, Ivan, is that fair? Um, yeah. Um, okay, so that's just, maybe that's the last thing we'll put on your plate. And then uh, maybe you can uh, give some final thoughts in response to Michael and, and, and Ivan yeah. and close us up. Maybe the last word will be Timbers, but you're- Okay, you can kinda... cool. I'm happy to give Timber the last word. Um, so in response to Michael's question, so, you know, Michael has been thinking about this. I think you, you wrote, you, you've been writing about this since the seventies. Um, I think you had a Stanford Law Review article back then too, that was pointing out the deep inequities in uh, the child welfare system. Uh, and so uh, I, I appreciate your question, struggling with some of these issues. So uh, the, the, I, I think we do have to look at what are actually the impacts of risk assessment. Uh, and it may be that in some cases, you know, we could see empirically that using a risk assessment tool leads to lower rates of child removal than uh, without using it. Um, but that's there's still the question about what the tool is being used for. Uh, and it's still being used for determining which families are going to be um, in, intervened on. And it may, it, it doesn't necessarily mean that the low risk families aren't going to be policed in some way as well. So there's the question of whether uh, the, these tools are categorizing families, but not, uh, but not ending the basic approach and that even the low risk families are still at risk once they're in the system of after being policed, having their children taken from them. So, uh, but, you, but it raises a question about incrementally as we work to end and dismantle the entire system, build a radically different way of addressing families' needs meeting families' needs, what are changes that are, you know, going to get us toward abolition and what aren't, aren't? And so I think your question raises that issue. We might still say, we don't want any risk assessment tools at all, uh, whether it's the, the social worker deciding or whether it's this particular algorithm or that particular algorithm. Or we may say, look, while we're working to end this approach, uh, it's better to have fewer families having their kids removed. And we can see that this tool does that. I, I would here recommend um, uh, uh, Prison by Any Other Name by Maya Shenwar and Vicki Law, who point out that there are ways that, you know, there's a kinder, gentler, a carceral approaches that end up just widening the net. And that's a possibility here with these new risk assessment tools. Uh, the other question about white families, poor white families involved. Um, yes, the, you know, as I said, the, the main way that this system is operated is to address the needs of uh, of marginalized families through this punitive approach. And it has never been designed for, you know, the most elite, i.e. white, middle-class and wealthy families. 
um, poor white people are also at risk, but it, there are still multiple ways in which the targeting of black communities is essential to understanding how the child welfare system or family policing operates. Um, and, and just one big difference is that uh, apart from maybe West Virginia, uh, in, in most places in the United States, there is not the concentrated involvement of child welfare agencies in neighborhoods like you have in black neighborhoods around the country. So the, ex the, the experience of black children as a, as a group entails involvement in child welfare, um, family policing, child protection, you know, in ways that is not true for white children in America. Uh, there are exceptions, but they really are exceptions compared to the pervasive way that this uh, form of state intervention affects large numbers of black children and large percentages, large portions. I mean, I, I think that I would venture to say that most black children in America have been touched by the child protective services or family policing in some way. I mean, actually, I know they have been statistics. I, I, I mean, but I think the vast majority have been. Whereas I don't think that's true for white children in America. Um, and so uh, that that's a diff that's one difference. Also, the the way in which the system is propped up by disparaging black families um, is crucial, I think, to the continuation of such a brutal way of addressing families' needs, which yes, like prisons, also affects white people. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, every, every racist aspect of America is harmful to most white people as well. But you know, the, the, uh, 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 real um, struggle we're having is getting white people to realize that and opposing uh, white supremacy. That that's Im that's important, and it and if uh, uh, it would be great if white people who are affected by the system, there are exceptions, but they have not been at the forefront the way that black mothers have been at the forefront and black uh, youth have been at the forefront of this movement, and uh, that we. You know, this goes into deeper questions about uh, the about a, you know cross racial alliances to end white supremacy. Um, yes, that would be that would be very effective to ending this system. <laughs> I, I I support that. Um, so taking hostage of children as an instrument of social control. Absolutely, that, that's why I said at the, during my talk that children are, uh, that, that the threat of removing children, either taking them away or threatening to take them away gives these state agents a huge amount of power to regulate families, control families, break up families, reassemble families, um, harm families. And it is, you know, we, we could, some terms have been weaponizing children. Uh, Nicholas used taking hostage of children because it's both the removal of them and the trauma and harm that causes, but also it is a way of then manipulating, exploiting, and, and supervising and monitoring intensively families in order to get their children back or to prevent the removal of the children. And so uh, that, that was a, an important part of the separation at the border. And it's also uh, an important and very harmful and violent part of the way in which 
family policing operates generally. I also want to make clear, I was, I'm not um, saying that family separation at the border isn't uh, an oppressive and abominable uh, policy that should be ended. Uh, my point in raising it was that we should also see how uh, horrific and abominable family separation is uh, in Harlem and, and black communities and indigenous communities and other um, marginalized communities, uh, including West Virginia uh, uh, around the, the nation. Thank you, Dorothy. Uh, and thank you for all the work. But before I thank you, let's let uh, Timber have the last yeah. word. Thank you. I'm gonna take the last word to talk about Professor Roberts. Oh. <laughs> so um, one of the realizations, if you will, that I had whenever I read your book for the first time um, is that you published this in 2002. 2001, actually, the paperback came out in 2002. <laughs> wow, yeah. 2001. And it yeah. just, it's, it's appalling, it's surprising, but at the same time, it's, it's not. Um, mm -hmm. That no one has been outraged by the things that you share in this book. I think I was listening to one of the talks um, of you discussing this book with someone and they described your words as aggressive. I would disagree, your words aren't aggressive, they are brutally honest and they lay out the ways in which this system um, oppresses Black families and the way that it's designed to do that from its original con uh, conception, if you will. Um, one of the other things that like really hit me um, emotionally, this is a really like emotional book to read me as someone, to, to, as someone who has experienced the system. Um, there was many times where I had to like sit it down and walk away. I was like, ooh, that's a little too close to my story. <laughs> um, but the, the point, I'm, and I don't remember if you said this in the book specifically, or if I just gathered this because of my own experience, but what I, what I remember thinking so poignantly, and even now, is that the color of child welfare is black. Mm -hmm. and I am the color of child welfare. Mm -hmm. And that's not by coincidence, it's intentional. Mm -hmm. And the more that we continue to overlook it, the more we continue to overlook your work to bring attention to that, we are overlooking black communities again we are overlooking the issues and the ways that systems are designed and um, even placed within our communities to disrupt and to uh, perpetuate trauma and harm, if you will. Mm -hmm. um, and that's just one of the things that just, the color of child welfare is black and I am the color of child welfare. Mm. I just couldn't get over it. <laughs> but the passage I wanna share with, um, everyone from the book. Um, it's the same one that I shared on the last um, panel. Um, it's on page 99. Mm -hmm. And uh, I'll just read it for you. Uh, it says, the opening passage of Children of the Storm still rings true today. The racism that characterizes American society has had tragic effects upon Black children. It has given, black, it has given the Black child a history, a situation, and a set of problems that are quantitatively different from those of white children. In a narrower context, American racism has placed black children in an especially disadvantaged position in relation to American institutions, including the institution of child welfare. In the three decades since it, the book's publication, the position of black children in the child welfare system has not improved. In fact, child protective services have become even more segregated and more destructive. As the child welfare roles have darkened, family preserving services have dried up and child removal has stepped up. Child welfare reflects the political choice to address dire child poverty in black communities by punishing parents instead of confronting the structural reasons for racism and economic equality, inequality. It is time to face the inescapable reality. America's child welfare system is a racist institution. Can I snap? <laughs> you, I'm snapping uh, at you, Timber. <laughs> thank you for ending on that most remarkable passage. Yes, thank you, Timber. And thank you, Dorothy, for writing it. <laughs>
Um, all right. Well, <laughs> we've run out of time. Uh, actually, we're long past time. <laughs> <That's> <laughs> but, <now laughs> but so uh, I wanted to thank you so much, uh, Timber and Dorothy, for, for this remarkable conversation. Uh, I know everybody joins me in thanking you for the for the artwork, for the spoken uh, word performance, uh, Timber, and for the uh, garden um, that you have made for us, uh, which we will continue to cherish and water and uh, and uh, and nourish and and be fed from. Uh, so thank you, thank you, Dorothy, for all your work. You know that was that was thirty years. You were talking about thirty years at that. Now that's fifty years ago, right? Uh, we would need to revise that sentence in that in that. Uh, Phrase. Yeah, I don't yeah, that, right. that you know. I mean, it's uh, the decades have gone on and yeah. on and on. You've been doing this work for more than thirty years, yeah. but um, thank you so much for that and for everything and for being with us. Um, it's been an extraordinary pleasure and an honor uh, to have you all. And thank you all for joining Bobby Butts and and Michael yeah. Wald and Jane yeah. Spinnick. Thank all you all. all. Yeah. Bobby, and, uh, you have to be in touch. Yes, everybody needs to yeah, continue the conversations here that have begun. Yeah. We will be back uh, for uh, Abolition Democracy 1113, where we're actually turning to issues of uh, climate mm. justice, uh, climate change. It's called Abolish Oil. And uh, we'll be here with... Uh, Professors uh, Battistoni, uh, Gondorfer, uh, Reinhold Martin, who's a dear friend of the 1313s. Here's the, here's where we'll be, and uh, I invite you all to join us on March 11th uh, at 6:15 to discuss abolishing oil. All right, thank you, Dorothy. Thank, thank you, Timber. You. Thank you, Bernard, for inviting us and orchestrating this wonderful conversation. I have now have lots of questions I have to deal with in, in writing this book. Great. So well, we can't wait to we can't wait to read it. Do you have a title? Do you have a title? Not not real, not uh, completely decided yet. So I'm not I'm not going to say it yet, but. Uh, Okay, okay. But um, it's going to be, it's scheduled to be published by Basic Books in spring 2022. All right. Yeah. Excellent. So a year from now. Great. Congratulations. Thank you. Okay, everyone, take care. Bye, Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. All right. Bye, Timber. Bye. Thank you so much, Timber, for your beautiful work. Absolutely. Thank you for inviting me. <laughs>